Sail GP is back in Taranto. Just three events down, and a new order has emerged. Spain and Denmark are challenging the Triple Series champions Australia at the top of the overalls. But after their epic win in San Tropez, can Emirates GBR repeat their performance? It's far from over, and every point matters. Welcome to Sail GP. Event four of season four of Sail GP moves to Southern Italy in the city of two seas as the world's best sailors arrive for the Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix Taranto. Our host venue is a natural harbor situated at the heart of the Mediterranean Sea, a perfect spot for fans to witness up close and personal the heart-stopping action as the foiling F-50 catamarans harness the power of Mother Nature on the open ocean. Alongside former world champion Emily Nagel and Olympian Stevie Morrison, I'm Todd Harris. Italy is the second stop on the European leg of the calendar, having just completed the last event in Saint-Tropez, France, and Spain is on the horizon. Points are at a premium, and it all starts on day one with three full fleet races that is followed up by Championship Sunday and two more fleet races before only the top three teams on points will race in the event final to determine the overall winner for the weekend. Before we get to today's first race of three, Stevie Morrison gives us a breakdown of today's course on the Mediterranean. Here we are above the beautiful city of Taranto, and let's take a look at the race course the teams will have today. Well, a fast start to the ticket to lead at Mark 1, and after the first turn, the boats can sail their own course, trying to find the shortest time between gates. At each gate, they can turn left or right. Remember that sailing boats only go fast when they sail at an angle to the wind, so we see them zigzagging around the course, trying to find a tactical advantage over the other teams. It's a steady wind here today and quite a short course, so the devil will be in the detail. It's about boat speed to finish first in front of the fans on the shore. And Mother Nature must be a fan of Sail GP because we have got great conditions as the fans continue to make their way here into beautiful Taranto for a full day of racing out on the Mediterranean. Right now, let's check in with the fourth member of our broadcast team down on the water. Here is Olympic silver medalist, Lisa Darmanin. We have a blockbuster weekend in store for us with the weather delivering in Taranto. Winds are averaging 32 kilometers per hour and gusting up to 45 kilometers per hour out of the southeast. Wind direction is fairly stable at the moment, but it is pretty gusty and there's a lot of wind chop, meaning a few speed bumps out here for the flight controllers to manage, especially at the bottom of the course towards those grandstands. The F-50 is set up with a 24 meter wing and high speed boards to help hit top speeds today. Unfortunately, I've got some bad news. We're just under real short delay while the French team are trying to fix some technical issues. They've had a hydraulic issue and the tech team, they've been, been trying to help the French for about half an hour and try to get them to this start line. All right, thank you very much, Lisa. Much more from you on what should be a very busy day with the operative word being speed. So before we go racing today here in Toronto, let's bring you up to speed on what has happened so far. Three events down here in season four of Sail GP. Season four of Sail GP is already shaping up as the most exciting yet. Oh, the USA have gone over. Another tight moment left. Oh, it's too close, too close. Three different winners have showered themselves in champagne. The Kiwis open season four with a victory on Lake Michigan. They win the Rolex United States Sail Grand Prix. Spain finished last in season three and turned their fortunes around in Saint-Tropez with new driver Diego Botin. And for the first time, Spain will claim the victory here in Los Angeles. Spain are now incredibly second overall. Denmark were one point away from their second final in three events in Saint-Tropez. I think he just needs to finish fourth. Oh my word, if Germany can get Denmark, that could be crucial for Denmark. That could have been a huge mistake by the Danish. 
A second and two fourths though is consistent enough to sit in third overall. Emirates GBR didn't win a single event last season, but with Hannah Mills rejoining the British team, her critical contribution is making an impact on the race course. And they pass the flying roof. Give the win to Emirates GBR in Central Pay. Despite not winning an event, Triple Champions Australia lead the way by just one point. Absolutely perfect from Sling Speed. So after three events, the standings look like this. Australia on top with 26 points. Then you've got Spain and Rockwell. Denmark, your top three. Emirates GBR City in fourth with the Kiwis in fifth, but a lot of drama. We'll talk about that momentarily. The USA, France, then it's Canada, Switzerland, and Germany rounding out our 10 international teams. Well, the big story happening right now in Sail GP is the absence of New Zealand. The Kiwis will not be racing this weekend. It is a huge loss because it is a very talented group. The great news is, though, everyone is safe and accounted for. But what a story in San Tropez. In San Tropez, New Zealand suffered a sudden structural failure of their wing sail. It was determined after investigation that it was caused by the wing coming out of alignment. We were just incredibly lucky everyone was on the starboard side of the yacht. Um, and the, the main element cleared us and the middle element went straight backwards. So. I think you know, right now we're just incredibly thankful everyone's safe. Despite Sail GP Technology's best efforts, the New Zealand boat wasn't ready in time for racing this weekend, but hope to be back for the next round at Cadiz, Spain, after a new wing sail has been through extensive testing. So with New Zealand unable to race this weekend, we thought we'd put Peter Burling to work, and we were lucky to have him on the commentary team this week. Pete, great to have you with us. You're an Olympic gold medalist, a two-time America's Cup champion. On all your years of racing, have you ever had something like close to that happen to you and your team nah um yeah it was uh, obviously incredibly scary yeah we weren't doing anything out of the ordinary and then just heard an almighty bang and watched the the wing fly over our heads so yeah i think the first thing for us we're incredibly thankful everyone's safe on board and yeah now it's about just trying to figure out where to go from here and pete obviously you're not racing today what's that going to mean for the rest of the season yeah it's incredibly tough um as a team we've already copped a, a huge hit um in San Tropez for the points uh, this weekend they've decided to allow us uh, point us five points and then um, yeah we're just yeah looking forward to bouncing back into it in, in Cadiz. Yeah I guess you're gonna have to bounce back essential to get back on points so uh, look forward to seeing you back out there soon thanks for joining us. Thanks man. So we're 145 away from race number one. Remember, it's three fleet races today. We've got Peter Burling with us alongside Stevie Morrison and Emily Nagel. Great day of racing. As Lisa Darman has already reported, we have got some serious wins. So, Emily, let's talk first. What is going to be the difference from what we saw today as opposed to yesterday's practice sessions? A lot more speed. Uh, already in the training leading up to this racing, we've seen 97 kilometers an hour by some of the teams. So eyes out for this first leg to mark one because we could be seeing some good speeds. And Pete, for you, this has got to be tough to watch because we're up on a minute to go until the start of race number one. You would be out there, and these are the kind of conditions that you and your team seem to do pretty well in, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, they're looking pretty top end on the um, on the 24-meter wing on the configuration. and. Yeah, we, we'd love to be out there. Who would have thought I'd be uh, sitting in a commentary box <laughs> talking to you with 50 seconds to go to the first race? But uh, it's uh, exciting to see the other side of the fence as well. And Stevie, this is usually what happens. We'll see the Kiwis in the back end as we this get a word from Mel Roberts. Wind is approximately 37 kilometers per hour. There we go, 37 kilometers an hour from Mel Roberts. So that's getting up towards 20 knots in old money. Big breeze out here on the water. And this first leg across to Mark 1, it's at 90 degrees to the wind direction. There's nowhere for the crews to go other than hammer down and straight line. We can see on the right-hand side of our screen, start line, the blue triangle. That suggests the fastest place to start. But I imagine surviving is going to be on the list of jobs for the crews out there now. We see Great Britain well positioned. Australia, left-hand side of our screen. They're on a long wind-up. Tom Slingsby's trying Trying to bring it in fast and hot at the top of the line here. Switzerland, Great Britain, well positioned. How's the timing at the top of the line for Tom Slingsby, though? Line's going to turn wide. 
What a start from the Australians. They're going to be fast to mark one, but how brave are they feeling on board the ruse? And the conversation has already picked up in pace. This is going to be interesting as we get to mark number one. The race is on in Italy. Oh, what a start at the top of line for the Australians. Nina Curtis called the overlap, broken into Mark 1, and they're clear ahead. Chased down by Contant de la Pierre's French team, and now it's all eyes on gate 2 for the, cream, for the teams. That ley line to the gate will arrive pretty quick. Imagine decisions are going to have to be made on the hoof here. It's going to be tough in the pack, but France looking for a smooth first manoeuvre. All the teams absolutely flying downwind. We had them doing 70 kilometers per hour in those bearways. Here you've got kilometers per hour, miles per hour, and knots. So 40 knots downwind is pretty impressive in these conditions. So, Peter Burl, I guess the big question to you would be, where would you want to be right now, and what would you do? <laughs> oh, it's pretty obvious, one saw <laughs> The Australians made that one look pretty easy. They did a lot of space up with the woman into the line and uh, just rolled over the top. So, yeah, it's definitely going to be hard to, to see anyone passing them from here, but I think they're real battles in that, that mid-pack from the, uh, the Swiss, the Canadians. I think as soon as you're back in the pack, it just becomes an awful lot harder to find space and make your decisions. And when you've got this much win, those decisions are being rushed on you already. As we see Denmark right well spin inside the US boat quick. Whoa, great control by the Danish there. A really fast split up. And the first boat to turn back towards the Taranto shoreline is Canada. And we can see if they can find a bit of space over that side. Space surely at a premium out here on the course. When you're stuck in the pack, it's hard to find that space, Pete. Yeah, it's um, quite different actually sailing on there's high speed configurations because it opens up a lot more options with the modes. You know, we see people on light air, the light air configuration, you, you're kind of stuck to one, but you'll see people really putting the bow down and getting some good speed up one to try and make some passes. So. Yeah, interesting day. So I think for those people new to sail GP, it's important to remember sailing boats, they can zigzag their way upwind. We see Denmark coming in here at gate two, and we can see he's got rights to turn inside, but he's got to do a bit of a handbrake turn here, turning the boat through the power, leaps up in the air, but good control from the Danish. And, uh, and they're back racing here. As we see, yeah, the modes that Pete just talked about there, that's you can either sail the boat quite fast at an angle a little bit away from the gate, or you can sail closer direction to the gate, but you're going to go slower. We see the boats zigzagging their way up the course at the moment. Our ladder lines show us they're progressing from left to right across the speed, the screen. And who's doing that best? Well, at the moment, it's the Australians. All the crews tucked down, trying to save on windage out here. So, so it's Australia, France, and Great Britain, your top three right now. Sorry, Emily, but Stevie, I got to ask you, to Pete's point, is this a case with this much speed, you have to wait for the Australians to make a mistake, and that's something they don't do very often. I think on a course like this, we've got a relatively speaking steady wind direction today. So it's all about keeping the boat fast and trying to do accurate maneuvers. And yeah, we know how good the Australians are. They don't tend to make many mistakes. So I think for the rest of the crews, it's damage limitation. And that's what we're seeing so far with the Australians. 65 kilometers an hour average speed. Spent the most time on the foils of everyone so far on the course. What we saw as well on that on this first upwind leg was the teams at the bottom of the screen. They had more breeze than those that went up to Toronto shoreline. Well, and we know at the top of the course we've got Lisa out on the water. How windy is it? This top gate three is going to be pretty dangerous. Are we expecting a bit of drama, Lisa? Well, I'm sitting right where the Australians are about to go, and there is a massive puff. It's super gusty out here, so this fairway is going to be incredible. It's all about staying in the pressure, and the Aussies know how to manage that. Gate number three is Australia will be the first ones to arrive there. Remember, this is a seven-leg race, the first race of three on day number one here in Toronto. Australia, Emirates, GBR, France, the USA, your top four. I look pretty smooth on board that Australian boat there. How hard's that manoeuvre, Pete? <laughs> Um, well, the fairway is actually probably easier than the roundup, to be honest, but yeah, I think the real mover up that beat was uh, GBR just taking that, that early tack and, and getting to the left slightly out of phase with the others. Uh, nice pass on, on the French, but yeah, looks exciting out there, for sure. Tight at the top here as well, coming in from the left-hand side of our screen with the right away Germany. Impressive first windy day. This is one of the windiest days we've ever had on Sail GP. Without doubt, the windiest day the Germans will have ever done out there in their F50. So, doing a nice job on board that German boat at the moment, up in fifth place. And as we say, Pete suggesting there, it's all about finding space and trying to get some speed. And the Canadians, they had space early on, but they're right at the back of the pack, weren't able to use that. Can they start to work their way through the fleet back in ninth? 
ninth at the moment. They won't be happy with that. Pete Burling join us in commentary. Pete, I got to ask you from a strategic point of view, day one, you can't win the regatta on day one, but certainly you can throw it away. Are you mindful of not having a real poor result, keeping yourself in a top five position in the first three races? Yeah, it was definitely, it's probably a bit easier said than done. Um, <laughs> yeah, that exact thing. But yeah, you, you've got to go out there, try and get off the line well and, and just put together solid results on, on day one. And you know, it's pretty impressive to see the Aussies coming out of the blocks was such Ooh. a strong one. Um, obviously, the British bouncing back off the off the momentum that they've had, you know, carrying that on. But yeah, it's a huge fight going on behind that. We can see that out in front. We have the ride heights, how high the boats are flying. And I think what's noticeable in these windy conditions is the boats are putting the, the teams are deciding to fly the boats a bit less high. I think that's a control based thing. The higher you get the boat up, yes, you're going to go faster, but you've got a lot less rudder. You've got a lot less foil in the water. We can see them beautifully from this onboard shot of Australia. And the higher you get out of the water, yeah, you're going to go faster, but you're also going to have a lot less control. So on days like today, we're seeing them at a ride height of about 0.7 to 0.8 of a meter. While on training days like yesterday, it was a bit lighter. They could foil around at over a meter. Pete, can you tell just by the conversations we're hearing coming off the boats that it's a, it's a little more hectic than normal because uh, it seems like the pace of talking has picked up a bit. Yeah, well, I think this is the first day the fleet sailed and, and missed much breeze for, for quite a while, um, probably back to San Francisco even. So, yeah, everyone's obviously a little nervous out there. They've raced one of the day. Um, there's some, sounds a little more hectic than normal. Obviously, I haven't sat on the side of the fence before, but, yeah, it's really cool to see them out uh, pushing their boats super hard. Someone that's not afraid of pushing the boat hard is the Canadians. They've taken two down there, fast and loose, as always, on board that Canadian boat with Phil Robertson. Nice work moving back through the fleet, and it's now all about finding some space, trying to get the boat going as fast as possible as we see Great Britain, France. They're chasing down behind the Australian boat, but our ladder line's showing nearly a 300-metre lead for Tom Slingsby on board Australia. There, 260, top left of our screen. As they set up for a manoeuvre, let's see how smooth they can keep it on that Australian boat. Yeah, one to ten on that one. Did you like that one, Pete? Oh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't give it a ten, but um, <laughs> yeah, obviously a long way in the lead, just trying to do some conservative manoeuvres, you know. Um, yeah, it looks pretty puffy out there. I think there's a bit more on this race course than, than what we're giving it credit, and yeah, it's cool to see uh, everyone uh, <laughs> sailing so well. I think what we're alluding to there, Todd, is the fact, sorry to interrupt, mate. I think what we're alluding to there is actually the wind's constantly changing strength. It looks fairly steady, but this is a nice camera angle. You can see there's some slightly darker and lighter patches of water on the water. USA just sailing into a dark patch there. Should see their speed jump up. There it goes, up over 59 kilometers an hour. And the crews are looking for those darker patches of water. That means more wind, but the communication on board, they've got to be telling each other that wind's coming. You've got the wing trimmer trimming the big wing sail. You've got the flight controller deciding how high you're going to fly and that's changing all the time as the wind speed changes so there's a lot of comms on board the boat to try and sail smoothly leg five of seven race number one of three on the first day of the rockwell italy sail grand prix toronto good to have you with us and it is all australia all the time they got the whole shot at mark number one and they have led and that's the first time they put the hole down on the water not the best manoeuvre at the top of the course there from the Australians, but now it's the final downwind leg for them. They need to turn the boat away from the wind through the power zone as they're going to head away downwind. Expect to see the speed accelerate massively on the bear away, and then it's going to be a straight sprint towards the bottom gate where they turn to the finish. Great Britain chasing hard, and a nice gust of wind in front of the British boat here. Could be windy on the turn away for Great Britain. We have seen the Brits closing this gap. They've sailed brilliantly in this race. At mark one, they were in eighth position, and now they're they're all, the, all the way up to second. You can just hear everyone working there. Hannah Mills spotting out for the other boats. Of course, you're going downwind and the other boats are going upwind. It's pretty hard to see each other out there, Pete, sometimes. Yeah, you definitely rely on everyone on board. Um, obviously, the strategists on the back play a really critical role in that. But yeah, also a lot of the, the G2s actually run uh, yeah, a lot of the communications. Uh, for those that don't know, we have all the locations of the other boats on the, the screen on the wing. So it's a really important tool for keeping the boats apart there as well. Yes, a pretty big day out there for the grinders today. The grinders are the people you can see at the front of the boat. They're the ones that are helping pull that big sail in and out, moving those grinding handles. You can see them working hard as the Germans squeeze round in sixth, but they're going to be really slow. Hard manoeuvre here for the German team, trying to block the Danes. 
That's the voice of Stuart Biffle, the wing trimmer on board the German boat there. They're trying to accelerate as they're being chased down now. Spain and Switzerland, well, they're struggling in these windier conditions. Not the result these crews will have wanted in race one. Yes. So at gate number six, it is still Australia out in front. Remember, they're the three-time reigning and defending champions. You cannot give them this kind of lead and a start like that and expect them to throw it away. That is just not something that Tom Slinsby and company do. As they make the turn around the gate, it'll be a high-speed race to the finish. And race number one in Toronto goes the way of the Australians. Good comeback by the British crew there, and perhaps no surprises to see two of these slightly more old and experienced crews in Australia and Great Britain putting in top performances to start their regatta. Winners in Saint-Tropez, Great Britain, will seem to be very much back on their bus, and they'll be happy with a second place. And perhaps, perhaps more importantly, again, the French coming here home in third, and Jimmy Spittles, USA, they're chasing down. A bit of experience showing its way at the front of the fleet. USA will come in fourth, France in third. That's a great finish for Quentin Delapierre. The They're getting their mojo back. If the Americans find themselves at the top end, a top four finish. And as we talked with Peter Burling, it's finishing well and being consistently on the first day. The Canadians, Stevie, you said they were running fast and loose. Well, Phil Robertson brings them in the top five. It's a really good comeback to move back through the feet. Peter just told us earlier that's the hardest bit. If you can turn a seventh into a fifth, or in fact, in Canada's situation, they were ninth. They've turned a ninth into to a fifth that's four points gained for them i think they'll be very happy with how they've sailed there a little bit surprised to see denmark in sixth they've been one of the stronger performance early on in season four here bit of reviewing for them to do and what a camera angle it shows us how gusty it is out there the different textures of color that's our indication of the wind strength how variable it is out there switzerland and spain they're going to be disappointed with that Tom. So race number one is complete as the Spanish come through in eighth, but the big winner to start things off, it is Australia and Tom Slingsby getting the win. What a great start on day number one here at event four, season four, the Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix in Taranto, and the Australians flexing their muscle once again, showing us just how good they are in high winds. We're lucky now to go down on board with the Australians and their driver. Tom Slingsby, Tom, it was a hectic day out there to start things off. Everyone's scrambling to get in position, and the wind picks up. How did you find it? How key was it for you to get that hole shot to mark one? Yeah, it was a bit of a scramble. Um, it's really gusty out here, and so, I don't know if you saw, we really only did one lap of practice just trying to preserve the asset. We didn't want to break something. Uh, so, it was, yeah, it was a bit of a scramble to get in there, but, uh, look, we got a good start at the top end of the line, had space, and uh, we're able to hold on from there. Tom, we've actually, we're sat here, we've got Pete Burling, so we've been doing a bit of judging on your uh, manoeuvres through that race. He said it wasn't looking as tidy as perhaps it could. How tricky are the conditions out there? Did you expect him to say anything else? But, uh, yeah, it is, it's tough out here. It's, uh, it, it's probably very hard to see from a helicopter view, but it, it's huge holes and uh, big gusts. We had a couple of gusts. Uh, at sort of 55 k's an hour, and uh, which is into the sort of nearly 30 knots. So we don't have our 18 meter wing on. We've got our 24 on, and that's uh, it's proving yeah, quite a challenge. Tom, appreciate your time. Wish you the best of luck and uh, continue to protect that asset. You've got two more races today. So the Australians strike first and get a big win. GBR finishing second, France in third. Well, it was a big, big race, and of course, as is so often the case, the start is the key, and we see bottom of our screen, Australia and Canada, and Pete said, Australia found space. If you start at this end of the line, you're closer to the wind, and timing's good, but you're going to then have a faster angle towards Mark 1, and Australia, they were happy to ride fast and loose all the way into Mark 1. They got themselves clear of the rest of the fleet, turned the boat away, and they made what was a tricky, windy first leg look very, very easy, Lost it away.
big lead and you just don't give that Australian crew a big lead because then when they get to the next gate, they're able to take their own decision and their decision was to take an easy left turn, try and be smooth. We could see the conditions were not easy to be smooth out there, but they stretched away. They were constantly gaining through the race and despite their maneuvers perhaps not being perfect, which is maybe worrying for the rest of the fleet, they were good enough. They kept the boat going nicely. They kept it up to speed. And then when we got to the finish, well, what a view for those fans in front of the shoreline here in Taranto. Starts off in the key, but for all the crews, how can they tidy up their maneuvers out there on the water? Because sailing slick and fast will be the key for the next two races. So Australia gets the win in race number one. Emirates GBR finishing in second place, and they had a strong showing, of course, winning the last event in San Tropez. A dramatic come from behind win as they pass the Australians and the return of Hannah Mills. I've been fortunate to sail with some of the very best sailors in the world, and, and Hannah's right up there, if not better than that. The input that now she, she's now giving the team is, uh, you know, second to none. This is my first win as part of the team on the boat. Feels like it's been a long time coming. And for me, you know, coming back after having baby Sienna and, and joining the team again in January this year, it feels like we've been slowly building and working out how it's all going to gel together. And, and yeah, I feel like we're on a really good trajectory now. I think it was so many different things, you know. I think the team, we've, we've had a lot of big discussions over the last few months about how we work together, how we communicate, you know, the boat handling and, and just getting all of that right is, is hard. You know, so GP, the racing is incredibly hard. Everyone's very, very good. We've had a lot of honest conversations and, and I feel like we just got to a really good place this weekend with how we communicate with each other and making sure we're delivering the right information and making the right choices um, at the right time. When it's going well and, and we're working together really well, I think we're pretty good. Hard to beat for sure. I think, you know, we've got quite a similar approach to the racing. So when that's meshing, it's, it's amazing. Like any team, you know, you can have challenging times where it's just, you're not quite on the same page. So that alignment, I think, is, is massive for us. Good games to us on the rest of the week. Hannah could be one of the first females to get to drive one of these boats in the, in the future, which would be really cool to see. The Women's Pathway Programme, I think, it's great to have females on the boat as role models. It's just so important, you know, for young, young, the next generation, you know, boys and girls, seeing men and women competing together, I just think it's so, so cool. And I know if I was a young girl watching that, I'd just be like, oh my God, that's, yeah, I want to do that. Or if I don't want to do that, I can do anything. And that, that's so important. So yeah, it's super cool. And Emily Nagel, how critical is the two-time Olympic gold medalist voice to Ben Ainsley on board? I think it's absolutely vital. Season one was all the gains were about good maneuvers, straight line speed and sailing fast. Well, now the entire fleet has leveled up, which means it's all about sailing smart and being heads out of the boat, which is where Hannah comes into play. And Stevie, how soon until you think we see a female driver on one of these F50s? And do you think it'll be Hannah Mills? Well, I think Hannah's got to be, you know, she's two-time gold medalist. She's got a lot of time. We can see Tash Bryant. That's footage from San Tropez on board Australia. There's a lot of these female athletes getting time on the water. It's just a matter of getting time on the water, time on the tools to learn the job. And it's no doubt they're going to be out there doing a fantastic job very soon. So race one complete, two more fleet races to go as the conditions are perfect. If you like speed here on the Mediterranean, it was a fantastic first race with the Australians getting out front and getting it done. Emirates GBR finished in second, France in third, the USA fourth, and Canada in fifth. Let's go back and break down that race a little bit more, Emily. There's a lot of number to digest. And again, the operative word today is speed. Yeah, it's all on on the course out there, just as we've heard from Tom Slingsby and from Lisa down on the water. Along the shoreline, we're seeing some really big gusts, up to 10 kilometers an hour more breeze in some of these gusts than outside of them. Then at the bottom of the course, we're seeing the breeze accelerate towards the bottom gate. So as the breeze comes along the water, it's picking up speed as it compresses up to the shoreline. So it makes those roundups pretty tricky for the trimmers. Um, and all the wing trims are going to have to be really focused on keeping that boat upright today. All right, we'll see how it all plays out. We've got one more race to go, and then the third and final race on the day before tomorrow and Championship Sunday here at the Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix Toronto.
Well, the skies are a little bit gray, but the wind is up, and that's exactly what these foiling F-50s like to see as the fans continue to get themselves a spot both on land and both on sea for the exciting second race still to come. Two more races still to go here in Italy, racing on the Mediterranean. Well, that racing is what we were all hoping for and we've all been waiting for. That was absolutely epic. It is super gusty out here, as we've heard, and I think that that was just an, an amazing display by the Australian team. We know these love, they love these conditions and they, they showed why because they just feel so comfortable. We can see that they can fly the boat a little bit higher than the other teams and really push it. They know the limit, but some teams, they, they, they kind of been pushing the limit, which is why we see them get quite unstable. I think in these conditions, especially it's where that coordination between the flight controller, the wing trimmer and the driver is super critical. And that's because there's two things you need to do. You need to keep the platform super flat. And that's up to the wing trimmer because as soon as that starts getting unstable, it gets hard for the driver and then also for the flight controller. So I think, I think the wing trimmer is a little bit underrated, but definitely today is their day to shine. I think the other really impressive thing in that race was the French. They had no practice. It's really windy out here. That's exactly what you want. You want to be able to cut a few laps and know exactly what you're doing. But the French, they came out with zero practice. They came out firing and they were second to Mark one. I know they got third there, but you take that result after, after that rehearsal. And then the Spanish was obviously the disappointing ones. They made the top three in the last two finals, but, it's a different game out here. We've had light wind finals, light wind regattas, and out here it's windy. It's a different game. And in their practice racing, in their practice laps, they looked really unstable. They didn't quite have that locked-in feeling that we see in the Australians. So I think that's why we saw them out the back. And, and also Switzerland having their new flight controller, Francois Morvan, and Glenn Ashby as a different wing trimmer. So we know that coordination is key. I think it'll be very similar in this race. It's probably more gussy. I'm watching Canada behind me. That's why I'm getting distracted, practicing their reach to Mark 1. We're going to see more of the same, that reach to Mark 1, super critical, rounding in front, and then you can kind of play your own game. As soon as you start battling with other boats, it gets super tricky. So you want to focus on yourself, go fast, and get getting to Mark 1 first is the key to that. So I think we're in store for some more epic racing. So don't go anywhere. It's going to be fantastic. And that is a sight we do not want to see. The word out on the water is Germany sail GP is done for the day. A problem on board with their technicals. So they will not be racing in race number two and three as they finished in ninth in race number one. Again, Germany done for the day. So the race is on now for race number two with just eight boats with New Zealand not being able to race because of wing sail damage in Saint Tropez and Germany unable to go after race number one. They have been towed back in, so it'll be eight boats racing in races two and three. Well, a lot of changes out on the water and on shore. Earlier, we caught up with Tom Slingsby and got his thoughts of racing without the Kiwis. Okay, New Zealand's are always annoying me out there. They're always around us, protesting us, laughing us, and so without them, it's quite nice, actually. But. Uh, yeah, look, it is sad that they're not here. Uh, we want to compete against the best, and they're definitely one of the best. So they'll be back next event, and we look forward to resuming the battle. So it got a little easier now without the Kiwis and the Germans in there. There's just eight boats, and Stevie, man, the Australians look so good. At that start they got, they just managed it perfectly. Well, Pete, uh, some kind words and some slightly uh, pushy words there from Tom. What do you make of that? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we definitely enjoy the, the battle with the Aussies. Uh, I think we've had, a, had that rivalry for such a long time now. And now we're definitely uh, looking forward to, to getting back into it. Obviously, we're, we're on the back foot at the moment, not even sailed the last couple of events. But, um, yeah, we're up for the challenge for sure. Yeah, a long season ahead. And, of course, remembering with Sail GP, it's all about that race to San Francisco. But when you get there, if you can make the grand final, you just got every chance of winning it. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, as a team, we're, we're really happy that we've actually got a win on the board. So we've got one up on them there uh, this season. 
Um, seems like they make a lot of finals, but actually trying to convert is um, still one of their work-ons. Um, but yeah, no, we're, we're really looking forward to, to getting back racing. <laughs> no, I look forward, to, uh, look forward to Tom picking up on that little bit of feedback for him, and hopefully he can start converting. But now, right now, 1 minute 30 to go until the start here, and while the boats are already slowly starting to position themselves, it's pretty crucial timing already. They're already in their routine. Start line on our screen there. They're all going to come back towards the camera. One more turn, and then they line themselves up for that sprint to mark one. 115 to go, race number two. We remind you that Australia, Great Britain and France, top three finishers in race number one. 10 points to the winner, one point to last place, and it is all on here in race number two. A good opportunity now to make a move and secure your spot in tomorrow's event final. Oh, we see here the boat's already lining up. One more maneuver back. R bottom right hand corner of our screen, that circle there, that's showing us where the wind's coming from with the arrow pointing down. It shows us 30 kilometers an hour. The wind has dropped a little bit out here. So, time for the crews to maybe put the pedal to the metal a little bit harder. They should be able to push the boats a little bit closer to the limit here. Not quite as windy as we see. Rockwall, Denmark, turn. One last turn back, and then that start line looms in front of them on the top right hand corner of the screen. And it's all about that positioning. We saw Tom Slingsby's team started to the bottom end of our screen, the more upwind end of the start line last time round, but who can find that space this time? The whole fleet bunched closer up this end. It's a much bigger fight as France makes an aggressive move down on Australia. They've got to try and find a gap. Is there a gap? Ten seconds to go. It's Denmark looking good, but they're a little early. Australia's timing perfectly lined up for the pole position. Three seconds to go. Watch for the line to turn white. What a start out of the middle of the line from Australia on the money and they're now sprinting to mark one. Should be able to convert this into a lead for the Australian team. It is deja vu all over again. Like race number one, the Australians come off the line firing as they approach mark number one. Really tight in the pack here, Todd, as we see Australia leads the fleet around. Emirates Great Britain on the inside, pushing hard against the Canadians, but the Canadians are right in there, and it's going to be a bit of a bundle in the pack now to see who can get a good first manoeuvre and set themselves up towards gate two. Rockwell, Denmark go as we see Great Britain first to turn away. Straight. Happy to roll away a little. How key is that first manoeuvre when you're right in the pack there, Pete? Yeah, I mean, it's make or break. It's the amount of times you see a, a good position change coming from uh, you know, the reach mark to the bottom, uh, where that, that boat doesn't shift much from there uh, very often. And, yeah, you'll probably see France getting a little out of phase here. They're going to have to go back and take that, that right turn, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the rest of this unfolds. Two, one, coming up. Go. A tight situation. Rockwell Denmark have to take avoiding action there as we see Pete Berlin calling it right there. France do head for the right turn, but they're going to be disappointed that Great Britain have shut the door in front of them. So it's Great Britain in second place leading out of the right turn as we see Australia. Well, they're out in front again and they were happy to turn left. It's all about who can find some space now. They'll be thinking halfway up the next leg as Great Britain are sailing in towards a lovely dark patch on the water there. That should mean more wind. Chance to get Currently showing fairly equal across the course. 31 kilometers an hour of breeze inshore for the Brits. 34, 35, far right-hand side of the screen here for the Aussies. But we'll see how it plays out as they move up the course. As we've said, super gusty out there. And one gust could be enough to get the cross. We've got Peter Burling in the booth with us announcing, Pete, if, if this situation, kind of like race number one with Australia out in front, is this a situation where if you're in the back, you want to limit your losses and maybe just try to pick one boat at a time up and just pick up the points? Maybe you're not going to be able to catch the Aussies in this one. Yeah, well, I mean, wherever you are in the pack, you're always trying to just pick off a few boats here and there. Every point's so, so critical come, come the end of it. Um, yeah, I think both GB and Canada are doing a good job of keeping the pressure on the Aussies here in this one, though. Marginal, one of them. Better showing for Rockwell, Denmark. Stevie, they're sitting in second place. Remember, they finished in sixth in race number one. And this is like 
picking up as many points as you can because you can be in the top three at the end of the five fleet races, and those three will fight it out on Championship Sunday for the event final. Yeah, we saw a tight moment there. That was Rockwell Denmark with the wind coming over the right-hand side of their boat. They've got the right of way, so they had to carry straight on while Emirates Great Britain needed to take avoiding action. Now, everyone, first time if you're watching Sail GP, these ladder lines here, 100 meter increments. They're showing how far up the course the fleet have progressed, and it's all about progressing as quick as possible. Okay, Hannah Mills there talking about where the best pressure is. Best pressure, they're talking about the wind strength. More wind means you're going to go faster. And the right, as they talk about it, is if you're looking at wind. So if you're looking from the left side of our screen to the right side, it's the bottom of our screen. And funnily enough, that's where Emirates Great Britain are. Lisa, do you think Hannah's called it right? Do you think there is better wind offshore? Yeah, I definitely agree with Hannah. Um, away from the shore, there's way more breeze. I think it, there's just uh, the gusts are really funneling down this side, and I think they're going to close in on the Aussies here. The Aussies will be pretty strong, but the, the distance that they've closed in here is massive, and the Australians are going to have to do another manoeuvre here. And the voice of Hannah Mills continuing to give information to Sir Ben Ainsley, the driver for Emirates GBR. It is Australia, GBR, Denmark, the top three. The Americans have had a nice move. They were back in sixth. They've moved up to fourth. And Denmark here as well. They're pushing as we Australia setting up to turn away. Here and there, Australia. They think the wind's going to drop back in towards that Taranto shoreline. So that's good news for Grand Britain and Denmark. Pete, you heard there, both teams kind of wanted to turn right, but Tom Slingsby felt trapped to go in left. How, how trapped are you by the limitations of doing manoeuvres in these boats? Yeah, well, obviously, every time you do a manoeuvre, you just take that, that instant loss. So you've got to make sure you, you pick and choose wisely when you do them. And, and it looks pretty shifty and puffy out there. So, you know, if you're at the wrong time, you know, as we saw in that, that final in Saint-Tropez, uh, you, you can't pull them off uh, or you'll lose boats doing extra ones. So, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. You know, I think um, GDR has definitely got the, the favoured turn, favoured side of the downwind, and, you know, hopefully they can close that gap for the Aussies down this run. And looking at that last leg, we can see that the Brits have closed that gap. Their average speed was higher than the Aussies for about the same distance sailed. So Aussies can't let up just yet. I think what's interesting, Todd, is, you, you know, you just heard a little bit on that upwind leg of the comms from Hannah Mills, from Ben Ainsley, and they both won a lot of Olympic medals, we know that, but you can't underestimate the importance of momentum in sport, and that victory they got in Saint-Tropez must have been a big confidence booster, and they did sound a little bit more confident. That said, to me, to my eye anyway, that's a little bit of a gain for Australia there, so he might not have wanted to head back towards Toronto, but sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. That's always a good sign when your driver says he's happy with the pressure at the moment. The Australians continue to lead. Remember, they won race number one. We're on leg four of seven. It's a pretty slick round up by that Australian boat there. As Pete said earlier, it's hardest when you turn the boat up through the wind. This is the high risk part of the race, is what he's saying, as we can see here. Australia, they choose to head offshore this time, perhaps learning the lesson from the race before, but the rest of the fleet, it's getting pretty strung out in these windy conditions, and it doesn't seem like the boats in the pack are able to close that gap at all, Pete. Yeah, well, actually, I think GBRs yeah, managed to hopefully get a, a nice little puff out on the left to, to keep things close. They, they obviously gained on that, that right turn at the bottom out to the left-hand side of the beat and getting the, the right at the top um, while minimising the manoeuvres in the last race, and they've got to continue to try and follow that trend this time. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. How much of this is all preordained before the start? Have you made a plan before the start and then you're just trying to execute it in the race, or are you actually thinking on the foot? Uh, it's a bit of both. Uh, you definitely have your kind of favoured idea of what you think the, the favoured parts of the course are. And you know, the unique thing about Sail GP racing is you obviously have to stay within the boundaries, so you can't just you know, send it out there and, and do one tack like you would in a more traditional uh, yacht race. So you've got to pick and choose where you're going to try and take gains. And yeah, I think that's what you saw on that last beat is uh, GVR getting that really nice gain on the, on the top right. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the Aussies covered them out that way this time. 
Here we go. We can see our ladder lines here, Todd, showing that at the moment it looks like another big gain for Great Britain. We just heard Ian Jensen, the wing trimmer, saying another righty. So he's saying the wind might be about to turn to the right. If it does turn to the right, that's going to favour Great Britain because when they come back towards the Australians, they'll have the right of way. If it's tight, this could be a big moment for the Australians to deal this with. This is the race committee. We are moving the windward gate. Course axis now 155. Here we go. Big moment in the race now, Todd. Right of ways with Emirates Great Britain. If it's tight, we could have a lead change. Okay, am I right? They have to work it up. Boy, and Emirates GBR, they are getting pressure on both sides. They've got the Australians there on the cross, but right behind them is Rockwell, Denmark. We are on leg five of seven, so they'll make the rounding up here, head back down, and then a quick right-hander to the finish line. Well, here we go. Now we're lined up as we come into this final upwind gate, and it's a match race between the two main protagonists in these windy conditions. Slingsby keen to take the same route as Great Britain. It's going to come down to Australia's execution. Hard manoeuvre here for me, this one, Pete, to do a tack and straight into a turn away. Two turns within a few seconds, pretty hard to execute. Yeah, well, I think the interesting decision is, you know, what Tom's going to do here, whether he's going to cover or whether he's going to go straight away since Carl, so he's covering. Um, yeah, this tech bear away, definitely interesting. I think you'll see uh, Jason flying it through from down the load. Okay, down Talking about the flight control. Right away, Denmark. Wow, here we go. We've got a party spoiler here in Rockwell, Denmark. Great comeback by the Danes, making it hard for Great Britain, and that's probably the best news there is for Tom Slingsby on board Australia, as that's a few metres lost for Great Britain, and it's a real battle. Here we go. Great Britain versus Denmark for that second place. As I think from here, Australia's lead should be unsurmountable. It, it's been quite interesting seeing how the Danish have sailed this past couple of legs compared to the Aussies and Brits. The Aussies and Brits have done more manoeuvres. See there, one on board Great Britain, and they didn't have the right of way, so they had to dive behind the Danish boat, but then look at that. They have to spin back up to get round the gate, well executed on board the British boat, but you can't get away from the fact they've lost some metres there, and Ainsley will not like that. So here's a live look at the course right now, leg six of seven. When they get to the top, they'll make a right-hand turn. There you see Emirates GBR trying to close the gap, and it's starting to grow just a little bit. The speed's on top, over 70 kilometers an hour for both Australia and Emirates GBR. And here comes Denmark on the right side of your screen. The race is really on between these three. Key moment here, Todd. At the moment, Great Britain have the right of way, but the question is, can Great Britain make it down to this next gate with no more maneuvers? If they can get straight there, good news for Great Britain. If not, in about 30 seconds time, when Great Britain and Denmark come into that final turn, it could be advantage Denmark. Looks OK for Great Britain in the minute, Pete. Yeah, yeah, they're doing a nice job just soaking down and then that, and that little vein of pressure. And yeah, it looks like it's going to be a repeat of race one for the 1-2, the doesn't it, at the moment? Hey. Nice work there by Great Britain. They've managed to make it work. They've got down to laying into the gate here with the Australia turn to the finish. And at gate number six, they make the right-hand turn, make it two for two for the Australians as they win again in Toronto on day one. Emirates GBR close behind. This was a lot closer than race number one, so we'll see what happens in race number three. If Ben Ainsley and company can fix any issues they have and get the win, but they are keeping pace with the Aussies, and that's important going in to the second day. Remember, you've got to be in the top three on points to race in that event final. Good performance by Rockwell Denmark to finish in third. Good result that from Sahestad and his Danish crew. I was pretty, pretty surprised they were sixth in the first race. Didn't really think that was where they'd be in this breezy conditions. We're always so happy with their handling. And again, a fourth for France. So it's tight there for sure, as we can see that Canada come home in fifth. So Canada goes five and five, and the Americans, boy, they were doing well. And then they had an incident out there with one leg to go. They will finish in sixth. So the Americans with a fourth in race number one, a sixth in race number two, but everyone trying to keep pace with the Australians as they win again. As the Swiss get around Spain, they'll finish in seventh.
So Spain will bring it home. Remember, just eight boats racing today. Germany having problems on board. And, of course, the Kiwis unable to go after their incident in Saint-Tropez. So the fleet just a little bit smaller today. Only eight international teams as opposed to ten. Lucky now to go back on board with the Australians. This time, we'll just go right past their driver, Tom Slingsby, and go to Nina Curtis. She's the one in the back of the boat, the strategist, making the good calls. And uh, Nina, tell us what it's like out there. You guys have put in a master class on starts today. Yeah, we can hear you. Sorry, I lost the question there. <laughs> oh, no worries, Nina. I just wonder what it's like down there, and, and how are you guys able to get such great starts and put yourself in the position to win these things? started off really windy today but we're kind of going into it making sure that we're racing um, really hard and as hard as we can it's getting trickier and trickier with lots of gusts but just kind of sending it it's pretty fun out here oh nina it's great to see you back out there just just had a had a little baby dylan which is pretty cool i imagine you've had some fairly sleepless nights uh, how much is this going to give you a sleepless night because it looks pretty wild out there on the water today <laughs> It's like a baptism of fire getting back into it, but I'm lucky, you know, my baby girl, she sleeps through the night, so I'm, I'm getting good night's sleeps. Uh, so you got next to you, you've got Kyle sat next to you there, wing, wing trimmer uh, on board the boat. Kyle, there's a bit too much wing up there out there at the moment today. How hard are these conditions for you to manage the boat in this breezy stuff? Uh, yeah, I mean, we'd much rather be on the 18 metre wing. Luckily, coming into the racing now, uh, the breeze has actually dropped quite a bit, but before the race, we weren't actually doing too many warm-up laps because we were just trying to preserve the asset, didn't want to uh, cause any big damage. Um, so, you know, we're trying to get around the course safely, but as the breeze drops, we're starting to push a lot more and, and race a little bit harder, but it's, it's certainly a bit sketchy with the, the middle size wing up. Kyle Langford, Nina Curtis, we appreciate your time. You guys uh, keep an eye on that Tom Slingsby character. Keep him in line. <laughs> Well, and here we go. Of course, really, that start was pretty crucial again. And we see how accurate these Australian were as they hit the line. We see that it's right on the money. Very, very close. Could have only been millimetres in that. Pretty much perfect start from Australia, I'd say, on that one. So that's two for two from Tom Slingsby, which he'll definitely be happy with. And again, they managed to convert that. They drove over the top of Emirates Great Britain, who did a pretty good job of hanging on the inside in Mark 1. As we said, big, busy moment of the race there. Next Next busiest moment of the race is when you get to gate two. And the interesting thing we learned here was that that right turn towards the shore that Great Britain took was a bit of a gain. So will we see the crews trying to prioritize that in the next race, or are we just going to see a monumental battle? Because the battle that took place between Australia and Great Britain in this second race was absolutely full on. And it was that little moment at the top of the final up win leg where Denmark came in to play spoiler. Cost the British a few metres, meant their challenge for the Australians was over. But it's gusty, it's shifty out here, and there's all to play for before the finish of this next Ross race. So let's take a look at the standings after two races here at the Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix Taranto. It is Australia on top. They have won the first two races in grand style. Emirates GBR sitting in second, trying to keep pace with them. Then you've got France and Denmark running at the top four. Remember, only the top three will be in that event final. But Canada and the USA still within striking distance to get there. Tough going so far for the Swiss, Spain, and Germany done for the day. The Impact League is a first of its kind in sport, a competition running alongside the racing that tracks the positive actions teams make to operate in a more sustainable way. As well as scoring teams for operating sustainably at every event, they also have to deliver four focus projects during the season where teams pitch ideas and innovations on how they can be more environmentally and socially sustainable. The first was titled The Race to Zero Waste, which Australia has won with an ingenious reusable solution for quick repairs sometimes needed while out on the water. Our project was based on an idea we had after saint Tropez last year. We are coming into the finish line with Team New Zealand and we had a massive nosedive, which happens quite often in the 50s. Oh my oh, word! They dip it. Oh, he's crashed down! New Zealand, what a move from Burling! Um, we broke our front bearing and, and to repair it we had to use, you know, we think over 100 metres of cling wrap to repair that bearing. 
Um, so we thought, you know, we can't have this happen again. So we've come up with a solution so we can prepare the fairings on the water, get racing without the, you know, single-use plastics. The guys came up with an idea to prefabricate this sailcloth, you know, structure that wraps around the fairing that can be tightened, quite universal. So now it's going to be, you know, used across the fleet. Um, it's been approved by the tech team. If the boats have a crash in between races, within a couple of minutes, we can repair the fairings, get racing, and you know the same structure or piece of fabric can be used in the next race and the Not seasons to come. Finished. You know, it was all about you know how we can you know get ourselves sailing quicker. But at the end of the day, look, at, it's it's working really well. It means we get rid of not having to use that cling wrap, not using all the tape and plastic. I think if any project when you work on it. You know, you're hoping it's going to succeed and the fact that this, sort of this all came together and the ideas worked out like we'd planned, uh, you know, we're very proud of that and uh, so it's great to see it going to be rolled out to the whole fleet and, you know, hopefully the other teams are going to come up with some great ideas as well that we can use on our bit. So for their Race to Zero Waste initiative, the Australian team pick up 100 points towards their overall Impact League scores. The Swiss team gained 90 points for coming up with a way of washing the F-50 boats, reducing and reusing fresh water and avoiding spillage back into the ocean. And the Brits came third for their educational program around climate action and waste reduction. Positive actions from all the teams involved in SailGP. So the third and final race is just moments away here at the Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix in Taranto, and everyone will be scrambling for points. Remember, 10 points to the winner, one for last place, and you do not want to be at the bottom of the table because Championship Sunday is a, just a short distance away. Well, the Aussies did exactly what they needed to do, but the British didn't make it easy for them. They were right on their heels and were just there just in case the Australians made a mistake. The day is changing out here a little bit. I'm not sure if you can see behind me, but there's quite a lot of cloud around. And when the clouds are around, that does play with the wind a little bit. We're seeing really big gusts out here compared to the average wind. And generally, that's when there's clouds around. It really dumps the wind from the sky. So I think that's why it's so erratic out here. So if I was sailing out here, the things I would be looking for and the things that you should watch out for whilst you're racing is that there's no pattern out here. You want to see the pressure at the time you are. Often they want to turn left or right, like on a normal standard day. But right now you're going to hear those strategists and the drivers talking about, okay, right now the pressure's in the right. Right now it's in the left. And that's how they're going to make the decisions on which gate that they're going to take. So I don't think any two laps are the same out here and the day is changing. The breeze is also meant to go around to the left. And as it goes around to the left, it will be even more gusty and shifty. So we could be in for an exciting race. We got USA just behind me here. They were going quite well in, in that race, but they actually had a big incident. They were coming in. They were not the right away boat and they were coming in. And I think it was, I think it was France at the time they were coming in and U USA had to do a big crash tax. So they had to turn the boat really fast, not prepared. And they lost up four or five places out of that. So there's lots of battles going on at the front, but there's plenty going on in the mid pack as well. But we know what it comes down to. It comes down to the start. We know that at the top of the line in the middle at speed is going to be critical. And who has the guts to push the F-50s as hard as they can on mark number one? I think the British, they're going to want to push the Aussies. They're not going to want to come second behind them again. But you know what? The Aussies have shown us time and time again. They absolutely love that reach to mark one. They love pushing. So we're going to have to wait and see another epic race. Back in Toronto for day number one of the Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix. And so far, it is all Australia. They have won the first and second races. But Emirates GBR right behind him. They have finished second and second with one more race still to go on the Mediterranean. So this is a scene as the eight boats get themselves into position. Why just eight boats? Well, New Zealand had their incident. They are out of this one. That taking place in the last event in Saint-Tropez. And Germany, Stevie, 
and they are done for the day. They've got some serious board issues. Yeah, well, here we go. We can see now they're dropping that new board down. Board drops down okay here as they set up for a maneuver. They're going to turn the boat, but as the camera's going to start to pan across the boat here to the new side, once you put that board on the right-hand side of our screen at the moment down, you need to lift the left-hand one up, but you can see there that it should be coming up, and it's going down there. And as it down, look at that on the left-hand side. Wow. Absolute shocker there. That whole board has just been peeled open, but I think the crucial thing in there is we could see that board on board. We can see the chat on board. There we know the shot off the boat there. That board to the side of the boat that they're now on should be coming up, and we can see it's going back down, and in going back down, it's got a huge load on it the wrong way. The load there is not lifting the boat. As it's being dropped down, the load is actually lifting up, as we can see where they were on the course here. There's a, a shot of where they're sailing around the course. It was on that final turn in towards the finish there that we can see. But what's happened, we believe, and it's all speculation at this point, is the board should have been coming up. Someone must have accidentally pressed here. Great shot of all the data. This is all the numbers coming into the scene. It gives us an idea on the right-hand side there that when the board's been pressed to go up, we see it start to come up in the middle of the graph, second graph down on the right-hand side, and then all of a sudden, boom, it's dropped. We can only imagine someone stumbled, pressed a button. There's a lot of positions on this boat where you can press a button to put a board up and down. Pete might be able to give us some insight into that in a moment, but looks like maybe the button got pressed, Pete, and it started to go back down again. Yeah, I'm not um, quite sure what, what's actually happened, but yeah, for some reason it's got a, a massive negative load and pushed itself back down. So, yeah, it's uh, pretty scary. I don't think we've ever seen one snap in, in that manner. Uh, normally they're, they're down in the elbow, but... Yeah, it'll be interesting to see um, what, what the report says that actually happened. Yeah, well, not good news for the Germans out there, but it just shows us there's a lot of technology on these boats. They're going very fast, a lot of really big loads, and, well, we're down to eight boats. We've had two great races so far, so we just can't race to see what happens here in race three. And in case you're wondering, that piece of carbon fiber, that board was salvaged from the ocean, so they'll see what happened there, and they'll do a deep dive and study of problems. So one more race on the day here at the first day of Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix in Taranto. We are down to eight teams without New Zealand and Germany. So a little extra room there in the start box. Pete Berlin, you guys are classic for coming from the back and coming <laughs> racing in with this much space now. You got loads of room, lots of options, correct? <laughs> What are you trying to say? Uh, <laughs> we're pretty good at getting off the line as well, mate. But yeah, it definitely opens up our space having a couple of these boats on the course. Um, and in this windy conditions, it, I'm sure everyone out there racing will be enjoying just that little bit of extra space to, to have the options as to where to go out there. But uh, it's going to be uh, interesting if anyone can take this last race off the Australians. New Zealand is known for their great starts out of the back as they come blitzing towards the line. Got to give full credit where credit is due. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> I just wait to hear Stevie say, how's your timing, Peter Burley? That's what you my cue. <laughs> Famous quote from the man sitting yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So coming up on 3.15 to go, eight boats out on the water. This is the third and final race, and then tomorrow we'll have two more fleet races, and then the field is cut to only the top three. So, Pete, as we've got a little more time, as we look on board Emirates GBR and the squad there, as you guys look at day number two, how much are you doing math in your head? Like, we got to be here, we got to be here, and how much are you thinking what we did wrong and what do we need to do better tomorrow? Tomorrow. Yeah, well, normally for us as a squad, we really take that, that first day of uh, day two to you know, try and get a good one on the board, um, you know, take a, a bit more risk if we're, we're back. But then it's really that last race. You, you've got uh, exactly what you need to do in your head um, and you'll go and focus on, you know, what boats you do actually need to beat to make sure you get into the final. And, I'm sure no one will be thinking about that right now. I'm just trying to get another solid race on the board. And I think there's interesting questions. Before the start of all this racing, we heard a lot of the teams asking for the different setups of the other boats. And a lot of the boats were asking, how are the Australians set up? How are the British set up? I'm sure they would have been asking, how are the Kiwis set up? But how much are you looking at the data from those other boats? How much would a team like the French be looking at the data of the other teams and improving their speed through the day as well? Uh, it's pretty interesting, you know, normally you'd, you'd pick as a group you know, what you actually want to deep dive into and try and make a game. You know, there's so much data out there, there's so many sensors and everyone has their own slightly oh, unique cool. style. So you've really got to just choose where you want to make the gains and, and get into it. So yeah, I'm sure if you're, you're trying to make an improvement in an area, you'll be looking at you know, all the good boats, uh, actually how they're, they're achieving that. 
And as Peter Burley can tell you, they <laughs> sail and save and share all the data across the board for the teams here in Sail GP as we come up on 140 to go before the start of the third and final race here as we get a good look at Spain. Winners in Los Angeles, they could use a big performance here, Stevie, with 90 seconds to go now before the start. They need a big performance. They've struggled in this windier condition, been perhaps a form boat a season four, but still plenty to learn for this Spanish crew. That goes without saying. I think a lot of it has to do with how much experience each of the teams have in these conditions. We've seen from the results today that everyone's been quite consistent in their positioning through the fleet. The Aussies, the, G the Brits, they've had the most time in these boats with these boards. We expect them at the front fleet. While the Spanish, Swiss, you know, they haven't spent as much time in these conditions, so it's going to be harder for them. Well, several teams, to Peter Burling's point, need some big points here to wrap up the day and give themselves the momentum for tomorrow to make that cut of the top three. You got to immediately look at the U.S., the Denmark, the Danish team probably needs a good performance. Spain needs a big performance here if they have any chance of repeating what they did in Los Angeles. Stevie, we're coming up on 35 seconds now to go, the start of race three. And look at that, the whole fleet shifted towards the bottom of our screen. They all want to be at this windward end, the end of the line closest to the wind where Australia have come from who doesn't want to be there well it's Australia he's going to be able to dominate the start from that position perhaps a little bit close at the moment but all the boats are going to struggle to squeeze in at the top as we see Canada dive down the line Australia well positioned for that pole position here now it's all about lining up and timing here line will turn white when we're clear to go but Australia look a little slow they're near pole position as we're going to start this is the umpire's early start penalty Australia. oh there you go who's going to beat Australia maybe Australia Australia are going to beat themselves. They need to drop to the back of the fleet as Rockwall Denmark started in pole position. Can they convert that to a lead at Mark 1? They look like they're struggling to get down to it, but if they're fast enough, they're across the French. It's going to be the Danes that lead at Mark 1. At mark number one, it's Rockwell Denmark that takes the lead and goes into first place with the Australians. A self-imposed mistake as they cross the line too early, and it is all on now in the third and final race of the day. Australia there, they're going to be at the back of the pack. It's going to be costly for them, that Canada. Well, they're in the middle of the pack. They need to make a move here. They've been consistent, but perhaps not consistently as good as they'd like to be, as we see Denmark stretch all the way to that yellow line. That's the lay line. They're well lined up for a left turn at gate two, and the two form boats of race one, where they're back in the pack. Australia still showing a penalty. They've got to drop back behind Spain here. They're making this penalty very, very costly for them. They're going to have to lose a lot of distance and they will start the first upwind leg way out the back of the pack as we hear Tom Stingsby not happy. There you go, finally cleared the penalty. Carl Langford tells him to settle down and now they've got to pick their way through as we see Denmark. Good rounding there, nice and smooth. They're chased by France and that battle between Denmark and France perhaps already setting itself up as a race for the podium tomorrow. This is the umpires. Penalty, Switzerland, relative GBR, port tack boat not keeping clear. Are you going to... Oh, there we go. That's Chief Umpire Craig Mitchell coming over there, dishing out the penalties. A fairly simple penalty there for the Swiss. They're going to need to drop back behind the British to clear that penalty. It's a boat-on-boat -boat penalty, that. So Switzerland need to drop back behind the British, and they need to do it quite quickly. Great to see the Danish and the French leading the charge here. Both teams going at almost 68 kilometers an hour of average speed, foiling more than everyone else, maneuvering really well. And this is something we've seen the Danish team get better and better with at every event. Yesterday in the training, we saw that both their tacks and jibes, both maneuvers up and down when they were doing the best out of all of the teams, getting the most distance towards the marks each time. And France and Denmark are two of the teams that are on the bubble to make that third and final spot in the event final coming up as we are on lake three of seven, the third and final race of the day as we go down on the water. Lisa Darmanin, what has changes from what has changed, I should say, from race one and two to what we're seeing condition wise on race three? It's getting more unstable out here, Todd. We've had a lot of cloud activity around. The sun's just come out. 
but we have another cloud front coming. Super gusty, so the teams are really going to have to make the manoeuvres to stay in that pressure earlier rather than run out. The other thing is the Danish team, they traditionally really love the gusty, tricky conditions when the wind is up, so I think they're relishing in that right now. Uh, to me, it's sort of the same sort of pattern. This away from the shore at the top of the course, there's really good pressure, so if you can come over here, so where the French are heading now, if you can get over here and really good pressure, you, you may be able to attack at this next game. Oh, no, thank you for that, Lisa. And we can see there the French heading back away from the shore where we should expect more wind. It's getting gustier and shiftier out there, Pete. Lisa told us perhaps strategically what you might be doing. What, what's happening on the boat? What are you thinking on the boat when it gets gustier and shifty like this? Well, it's all deciding how many manoeuvres you want to do based off you know, what phase you're in. And you can obviously see that the Danish there have made a decision to try and minimise those manoeuvres and then take the gain on the next downwind. So you probably see them take a little short-term loss, um, potentially hold, hold their position, but then really uh, accentuate that after that, that mark. So it's really just deciding you know, when you want to play your cards and um, try and play far enough ahead that you can really maximise uh, the opportunities. Good job of that by Rockwell Denmark here on that up. Well, looks like they've converted that quite nicely at gate three. Rockwell Denmark make the turn at gate three. They have the lead, France in second, GBR, Emirates GBR in third. So they are probably the best place right now after you're getting a second and a second, and they sit on third. Remember, it's combining all your points that you've gained, and only the top three at the end of the five fleet races will make that event final. France really rebounding nicely, Stevie. They got a third in race number one, a fourth in race number two. If they can keep second place, they are in a prime position to make the top three. Good enough. I've got to say, I mean, we talked maybe about Emirates Great Britain. We're on board with them at the moment. The pressure really being them on in Saint Tropez. Perhaps that wing, win, sorry, has taken a little bit of pressure off. I think for France, this is crucial. If they're going to have any hope of being there, we've got a tight moment at the top here. United States having to dip behind those two boats, but they're going to end up in space and slingshotting out. Oh, take a look at the Australian boat. Big bear away. They got too fast. They got too high. Got the foil lift all wrong there and flew out of the water. A disaster for the United States. They're going to be at the back of the pack. Wow, it got pretty loose there. Oh, here we go. Wow, well, there you go. They're off the screen now. It looks like perhaps some issue on board there. The US boat. Oh, wow, we've got a man overboard. Okay. They look like they so found got... Hans here. Hopefully Hans Henken should be fine. Nice. Big nice jump anyway. out of the water, as we heard there. Looks all good on board that US boat, as we hear now. Rockwell, Denmark, stretching away. They've done a fantastic job. Played their cards just the right time there, it would appear. And they've turned a tight lead into a big lead. But yeah, I think the pressure's on Denmark. The pressure's on France to make the final here in Taranto for the season. Both of those really need an event's win, and they need it soon. Hey, race committee, race committee, leave the meeting, quote immediately. Nice say. And that is not the news we want to hear as Jimmy Spithill has called for the medic on board. You heard him say man overboard. Hans Hanken, we believe, is the athlete that has gone overboard on the U.S. team after their moment out on the water as the medic team has raced out there. So the Americans not moving at the moment. They are tending to Hans Hanken on board. We will try to get as much information as we can as the racing continues on with Denmark out in front. France now just getting a penalty, a self-imposed penalty as they go out of bounds. And then it's Great Britain now sliding up into third. And here we go, Australia. They get a little bit loose around that bottom gate as well. We heard it was pretty hard to turn these boats up. And the Australians, well, they're up to seventh, sixth at the moment. But they look a little bit loose out there, I guess, getting towards the end of the day. Perhaps people are starting to get tired on board the boats, as we see now. Denmark stretching out, they're sailing away from that Taranto shoreline. That's where we've heard there's more wind, and it looks like when you've got that big lead, Pete, it's a lot easier to make the right decisions. Yeah, definitely pretty uh, scary seeing what happened to the US at that top mark. With the, the, it just shows you the force of water hitting Hans uh, mm. on that, that little side of the yacht. But yeah, Denmark's just been cleaning this race out. It's been impress pretty impressive to see them just continue to, to sail away, and obviously the Aussies haven't been able to get that many, many boats back yet either so it definitely looks tricky if you don't get off that start line to, to make passes at the moment.
on that to last peak. leg there, we've seen that the Brits have started to close that gap again, sailing 74 and a half kilometers an hour average speed downwind and less distance. So pressure's on the whole time for the French not to make any more silly errors and go outside the boundaries. And Stevie, to Pete's point, you look at Australia, they started dead last because they had that penalty on the line, but they've worked themselves up to fourth. And this is what Tom Slingsby does. He finds a way to salvage points. And yes, it's fourth and they finished first on the other ones, but he's going to finish in a decent position to go with those two first places. Oh, I think we've said it before, and it's a little bit awkward because we've got Pete sat next to me for today. But, but last, last year, you know, the key difference between Australia and New Zealand and the rest of the fleet was when they weren't having a great race. I will they would be able to convert it, gain two or three places. And, and that's the skill in these short, tight, stadium-style race courses like we've got here in SailGP. It's how do you overtake boats? It's really not that easy to find the space to overtake those boats in front. As we see Denmark, you get out in front, all the crews should be good enough to win a race. They're saying a clinical, brilliant race. Let's not take anything away from Rockwall Team Denmark. Fantastic. But yeah, Australia are picking their way through. A fifth is a great result. And Tom Slingsby was thinking, well, a fourth would be even better than a fifth. So. Don't be surprised to see the Aussies push hard on this final downwind. They're well set up for the right turn here. They're going to be in an attack mode, very much in attack mode. And yeah, it's how do you overtake boats? That's what makes the class of the fleet stand out. You do good. Go to the bearway. We're just going to have Australia. Uh, copy. And Spain, actually, Ben, down there. Uh, yeah, Hannah Mills giving information to Ben Ainsley, the driver for Emirates GBR. They're currently sitting in third place. Denmark has the lead. I don't think anyone's going to catch them. France in second place. They've got a large lead over third Great Britain. And then Canada, Australia, and Spain. The Australians are going to be pushing hard here for every point they can. Currently in fifth position, that would see them and the Brits go into day two tied on points, which makes the battle for that final even more exciting. Emily Nagel doing some quick work on the abacus. That's always good to see, and everyone else on the teams will be also crunching the numbers tonight to see what they need to do. Remember, tomorrow there's two more fleet races before that event final, and for the Australians, they have dropped back to fifth place. So if they can pick up another position, they will put themselves prime to be right even with Great Britain. Here we go, Tom Stingsby trying to find that final finish turning gate there. As we can see, who's lined up well for it? Well, it's Nikolai Sehested and his Danish crew. They're well lined up for gate six, and look how close that finish line is. Should be a little bit of a cakewalk to enjoy the run to the finish here for the Danish. Big lead, you can take things easy. They're definitely taking it pretty easy, but they've sailed this race perfect. It's the epitome of clear sailing as Rockwell Denmark comes across the line and wins race three here at the Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix Toronto. That's all right. It's a good fit. That's a good lead. That is a good lead. I That's agree. Good lead. We do agree. And look at the fans on the shore. They're enjoying their time on the shoreline in Toronto. And the Danish fans there, well, they're going to love seeing that Danish boat bring it home. Good day for the Danes after a slightly juttery start. Contant de la Pierre's French crew coming home in second. They've improved the whole way through the day as well. And that's what it's all about in Sail GP. How do you keep improving towards the final? Nice day for the Garçons on board that French boat there. Yeah, so France goes three, four, and two. Emirates GBR comes across the line. They finish in third. So a second, a second, and a third for Emirates GBR. Solid day for them. Solid day. I think we saw the big grinders at the front of the boat there, Pete. This would be a pretty big day for the grinders out there on board, would it? Yeah, it'd definitely be a really tiring day for the grinders. And you know, it's the uh, only position that you really substitute your, your athletes in, in our sports. So I'm sure uh, you know, all the all the power power athletes for from Sail GP will be uh, sleeping pretty well tonight. But yeah, it's been a really <laughs> impressive day for the those top four. You know, um, obviously the Aussies, GB, and but yeah, the French have been the one that we haven't really been talking about with you know re three really solid races, and uh, that'll be uh, a tough one for that that final uh, spot tomorrow. Australia goes one, one, and five, so they do salvage the points after starting dead last on the penalty, and it'll be Switzerland finishing in six, Spain in seventh, still trying to get word on the situation on board the USA and the injured athlete we believe is Hans Hankins. We'll have much more from that, and hopefully tomorrow we'll be able to update you even more. So a great day of racing, and it is wrapped up with Rockwell Denmark 
getting the win in race number three. We go on board with Nikolai Sehested and crew. Nikolai, what a finish, and you carry a ton of momentum now into day number two. You guys start off slowly getting a sixth in race number one. You came back nicely in race number two to finish in third, so you are building as you win race number three. Give us an idea of the conditions out there and what you expect for tomorrow. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite up and down on here, but we have some big puffs. It's quite windy, and uh, yeah, obviously we're not quite sure what's happening with US, but we just uh, we just hope everyone's all right on, on board. I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's scary in these conditions sometimes. Nikolai, you, you seem to improve through the day. You, you perhaps had a maybe mediocre start, and then to bring it home with a win in the final race. Where have you made your improvements through the day? Oh, I think it was just getting more and more dialed in as we uh, as we went on with the day. Um, it's, it's been a while since we raced in Breeze, and uh, to be honest, the first race was just down to getting uh, getting a bit stuck in the start, um, and then we just got better and better throughout the day. And uh, yeah, I think to be honest, it was just I had to uh, to step up my starting game from the first race that helped a bit. Nikolai, we appreciate your time. Wish you the best of luck tomorrow. Congratulations on a great day one. Thanks, guys. Nikolai Sehested and the Danes get the win in race number three, and it was an absolute master class. No one near them as they cross the line. Today, we've really seen that position at Mark 1 is crucial for a good finishing spot, and that's why we saw Australia and GBR start the battle early to get that pole position. The Aussies too early, slowing down the fleet, trying to get as close as they can to the blue triangle while also killing time. And that meant squeezing the British team out of the way as much as possible. Unfortunately for the Aussies, they pulled the trigger just too early, getting a penalty and having to drop behind the rest of the fleet, leaving it open for the Danish team to sail through. And there we had it, the Danish sailing at 63.3 kilometers an hour of average speed, 3K an hour faster than the Brits. But eight maneuvers compared to the 10 that the French and the British did. So. There's two different modes that they can sail out there. It's whether they're going for all the shifts, doing more maneuvers, or just sailing fast and longer distance, which ultimately saw the Danish take the win. Well, and here we go. We look back at the beginning of the day, fleet race one, and it was the Australians that came out absolutely firing. Seemed to be the story of the day, really, Todd. If you could get across that start line fast, you've got a good lead, and you'd be able to stretch away, be able to keep things simple, minimise the manoeuvres. And I suppose in this windy conditions, Pete, you'd have to say keeping it simple and having your own path is really your, your goal. Yeah, yeah, your race could seem super easy or super hard depending on what interactions you have to have with other boats. And you know, as soon as you have to start avoiding other boats and making more maneuvers than a, a standard, it makes it incredibly hard. And you know, I think you, you see the way the first boats uh, cleared out in all these races is uh, really telling just how important that, that start is. But the, the real race is what goes on behind that to, for the, the boat that gains the most points. Yeah, race number one, the Australians in control from start to finish, they get the win. And Stevie, this is once again broken record time. If the Australians get off to a good start, they don't usually make mistakes that cost them. We saw it race number three, but race number one, it was all Tom Slingsby all the time. In race number two, again, deja vu all over again as the Aussies get this start, and it is the best time start brought to you by Rolex. Well, it was a pretty much perfect start. We'll, we'll dive into the data and find out how far that is. But that time, they were so close to perfect on the gun. It was pretty much up there, and, and they just converted it. I think from the first race, they had that little bit of feedback on the commentary from Peter Verling saying they need to tidy up the maneuvers. And I think the Australians perhaps took that to heart because we saw a much tidier performance in times of maneuvers. But the shifty wind out there on the water meant there was opportunity. Great Britain perhaps managed to minimize the distance, they say a little bit better than Australia. They closed things up, but this race was tight. And when things are tight, the Aussies tend to be pretty good at hanging in there. They led at the final turn away, and they managed to convert this into a really nice performance in front of the fans. And yeah, I mean, just a fantastic rate for Australia, this. Another win, two from two. And as then as we approached race three, 
Well, it was the Danes this time that led away. And Pete, you've got to say, Denmark and France sailed a pretty nice race in this end of the day. Yeah, it was impressive to see the way Denmark got off the line. You know, obviously, Australia and GV dragged the game back a little bit early, and they managed to get that sling sort through the middle. And, you know, just to be able to capitalise and continue to sail away. And you know, France obviously did it the same to the rest of the fleet just behind them. So I think that shows if anyone gets off the line, does a good job, then they're going to win these races and just how high that, that level is out there. So the Danes cap off the day with a tremendous performance, a massive lead, and they don't give it away as the French tried to track him down. Emirates GBA were in the running as well. Good way to finish day number one as Denmark takes the win in race number three, and they are looking very good to be in that top three position and go into the event final. So here we go, three races down, two more fleet races to go tomorrow before that event final. It is Emirates GBR and the Australians out in front, even on 26 points. France sits in third, the all-important third and final position, but the Danes just one point back. Canada still in the mix. They've got two more races to make up grounds. It's tough going for the USA. We'll have to give you an update on that injured athlete. And then it's the Swiss, Spanish, and the Germans rounding out the field. Um So we go now on board with Emirates GBR, and we've got Ben Ainsley and, of course, Hannah Mills. And, uh, Ben, a very consistent day for you guys today. You start off with two seconds, and you drop back one position on third. But all importantly, you were in the top position going into day number two. What were your feelings, and how do you think the team performed today? Yeah, it was a tough day. You can see the breeze was up. We haven't sailed on that much breeze for a while, have we? No. And so, yeah, tough for all of the teams. Uh, our team did a great job, you know, across the boat, uh, front to back, just handling the boat in this in this breeze. It's as you can see, it's not easy, and uh, we managed to came, come through and get three solid race results. So yeah, that's uh, all good. Looking go, building on that going into tomorrow. Well, Hannah, it doesn't really matter how many Olympic medals you've won, and, and you guys have won a lot. Uh, how important is momentum? That result in Saint Tropez was a good one, and it must give a little bit of confidence to the team. Yeah, definitely, you know, it was awesome to get the win in San Tropez. It's been a while, so that was cool. And I think, yeah, we just felt like for ages we've been building and building and, and made some changes and, and finally uh, started to see the results of that in San Tropez. And so, yeah, it was, it's been great to follow that up with a good day here. But sell GP, anything can happen. And, uh, Ben, you can see sat next to you, Ian Jensen, the wing trimmer. How big a day? You should have probably been on the 18-metre wings out there today. How big a day has it been for the wing trimmers uh, managing that power? Oh, it was a massive day for the for the wing trimmers and the flight controllers. Uh, yeah, Parker and Goops, <clears throat> yeah, really, really um, put it all out there for us today and kept us up in the air and and the performance was really good. So uh, that's when you count days like today. You really count on those guys and uh, they they stepped up nicely. Ben, thanks for your time. You and Han and the team get some rest, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for Championship Sunday as the Brits look to back up their performance in San Tropez. Tremendous job today out on the water in very tricky conditions. Speaking of the conditions, we want to go down on the water and check in with Lisa Darmanin to get an update on what we expect for tomorrow and how the teams are doing. Lisa. Well, you can expect the complete opposite for tomorrow, Todd. The wind is actually going to come from the northwest. It will be a little bit lighter, 18 kilometers per hour, gusting to 25. So the Aussies can't rest on their speed today because it'll be a completely different game tomorrow. I do think that it will still be quite gusty and shifty, so we know the British are pretty strong at that, so I'm sure they'll be looking forward to a change-up in conditions. And also, I think the Spanish and the Swiss will be looking forward to change-up in conditions because they did not really relish today. In terms of how everybody's doing the teams are sailing back to shore i know the germans are getting ready to crane their boat out once the wind dies down there there are spare boards so hopefully they will be back out racing tomorrow and i do know that all the safety assets are over with usa helping them out and making sure that they are helping out as much as they can and and we all hope that uh, all team members on board are okay todd all right, thank you very much, Lisa, for your hard work today, and we will update the U.S. situation as the information becomes available. Wow, take a deep breath and settle in because that is just day number one, and that takes us to Championship Sunday with a battle at the top of the board, Emirates GBR and Australia going one and two. It'll be a heavyweight bout on Sunday, no doubt about it.
Day number two awaits at the Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix in Toronto. So for Stevie Morrison, Emily Nagel, Lisa Darmanin, and Peter Burling, I'm Todd Harris saying so long for now. We're on to Championship Sunday in Toronto, Italy. This is the Rockwell Italy Sail Grand Prix. We'll see you tomorrow. The race is on in Italy. Oh, what a start. Really tight in the pack here. It's a match race. Two for two for the Australians. Rockwell Denmark that takes the lead. They've sailed this race perfectly.